Most of us who work in the documentary filmmaking space are freelancers. The freelance life has huge upsides, but along with the independence it offers, freelancing also comes with a lot of operational challenges that we have to navigate on our own. And that can feel lonely. So my goal in this video is to make us all feel just a little less lonely by sharing nine frustrating scenarios that all us freelancers encounter all the time when interacting with clients, along with how I think about navigating each one. Oh, and the last one is actually about all of us freelancers competing against each other. So yeah, stick around for that fight to the bottom. Hey everyone, if you're new here, my name is Austin Meyer. I am an Oakland-based documentary filmmaker, National Geographic Explorer, and on this channel, I share the field-tested skills, mindsets, and lessons that have helped me on my journey as a documentary filmmaker. If you've been a freelancer like me for a number of years, there's no doubt that you will have encountered some of these scenarios. And if you're just starting out as a freelancer, welcome. There's no doubt you will experience some of these in the near future. Either way, know that you are not alone. It's all a part of the game that we signed up for, so we might as well prepare for how we are going to play that game and respond when these scenarios come up. So let's get things started with some scenarios about money. Uh, because this is definitely a big one for us as freelancers as we pitch our services and negotiate with clients. And we got to start off with the client who is reaching out on, quote, a shoestring budget. It's funny how many times I've heard that exact phrase, shoestring budget. Like, where does that come from? Most people or companies who are looking for video services to hire, they typically have no clue what our services cost. But what they do know is that they don't wanna spend much. Notice how when clients say they have a shoestring budget, they hardly ever say what that budget is. Like, why aren't you being more specific? What is the budget if you know it's on a shoestring? The shoestring line is an attempt to get us as freelancers to lower our prices before throwing out a first number. It's telling us to expect a no unless we come down from what we already perceive to be a low budget. Whether the clients are conscious of it or not, they're trying to anchor us to low expectations and a low number so that they can negotiate from there. In this situation, I try to push the client to be specific about what their budget is. I don't want to let them get away with the shoestring line. What is the budget? Because when they throw out an initial number, then I can either decline right away and save everyone's time, or I can negotiate from that number to try to get other value that I might want. I can say, well, all right, this is my rate. And because your budget is significantly lower than that, really the only way to make up that difference is if you can offer value in the form of something else like free services, product, te experiences, testimonials, guaranteed referrals, or anything else I might want. When people say that they can't afford my services, it's usually not true. Very few clients can't afford my filmmaking services. What they're really trying to say is, Austin, your services are not worth it. As in, your filmmaking is not worth the value I get in return. One response to this is to lower my prices, but I think a, a better response is to tell a better, more accurate story about the value I provide. The best response is to make something that's worth paying for. Now let's say that a client doesn't even have a shoestring budget, they're shoeless. In that case, especially when we are early in our careers, people often offer exposure in exchange for work. Exposure typically comes in the form of publishing our work on platforms with a larger audience than the ones we have. And exposure does have value. We just have to determine how much value it has for us. Back in 2018, I made a short documentary called The Carpenter, and I pitched it to multiple media outlets. And a number of them came back saying that they wanted to publish the story, but couldn't offer me any money. They were offering exposure. Well, I was at the point in my career where I was looking to build up my portfolio with credits and affiliations. So just having those pieces come out with the publication was actually more valuable to me than money. So I made sure that each deal was a non-exclusive license and I then gave The Carpenter for free to The Atlantic, National Geographic, NBC. I swear this film is on like five YouTube channels at this point. And in exchange, I got to start my career with multiple big outlets on my resume. Similarly, this past November, I made a film about a turkey right before Thanksgiving that had a strong animal rights message. As an animal rights advocate myself, getting this film in front of a large animal loving audience right before Thanksgiving was very valuable to me. So when National Geographic wanted to offer me exposure rather than money, I took that deal. 
So exposure does have value, but the key is to make sure that we are honest with ourselves about why and how valuable that exposure is for us in our stories, because we should feel absolutely empowered to say no. Let's talk when you have money so I can pay my rent. All right, the third scenario I'm sure you will have or will run into is clients not understanding how pricing works. Many clients will ask us for our rate without providing any information about the shoot. I'm over here reading their email thinking, how many hours? How many cameras? Where is it? What kind of lighting? How many subjects? Is this a helicopter chase scene or a sit down interview? Can you tell me literally anything? Sometimes clients will ask me to take videos and photos, also not understanding that those deliverables are typically charged in very different ways. The way I proceed in these instances is to request a phone call, cut out all the back and forth and get them on the phone if possible. I tell them that my rates vary widely based on the demands of the project and then I start requesting the details I need to make an informed estimate. I also will see if I can get a budget number out of them so I have a sense of what we're working with. Usually that looks like me asking something like, can you give me a budget range you are working with on this project? Because that will help me determine what I can bring in terms of gear or what subcontractors I can hire. Then I typically tell them that I will follow up over email with my estimate. For first time clients, I often stick with day rates because I don't know how the projects will evolve. But for recurring projects and clients, sometimes I will lean into project flat rates. Now, when we talk about a client giving clear deliverables up front, one big mistake conception that I often see is clients don't understand how the length of a video relates to how much work it takes to make. Clients will come to us requesting a one to two minute video followed by a this should be easy or this shouldn't take long. Well, not necessarily. In fact, a really amazing one minute video might take significantly more work than a 10 minute video. That's why there is that famous quote. I'm not sure who said it, but they said, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. I try to be upfront with my clients that day rates are determined by the amount of work it takes to complete the project, not the amount of minutes that the project deliverable is. That's often irrelevant. But I also know it's on me as a freelancer to get a ton of practice and experience so that I can appropriately estimate how long it will take to make a one to two minute video based on what the client wants, or a sample video that they've shared with me of what they're kind of looking for. If we're able to negotiate for money in exchange for our services, our job definitely isn't complete after we've sent in our deliverables, and that's because the invoicing process can be a whole saga itself. It happens all the time, having to chase down clients over the course of months to pay invoices on time. And that's why I keep a Google Sheet that details all of the invoices I've sent, the date I sent them, and whether or not I've received the payment. My newest solution to the problem of chasing down invoices is that when I can, I put payment terms in my contracts that forces the client to pay late fees if I'm not paid during certain windows. In my most recent contract, the language I used looked like this. Name agrees to pay whatever the rate is, plus travel and expenses within 15 days of receiving an invoice from Austin Meyer LLC. A 5% late fee will be charged for payments received between 16 and 30 days. A 10% interest late fee will be charged for payments received after 30 days. Additional 10% late fees will be assessed for every 15 days thereafter. I haven't been using this strategy for too long, but so far I've had good results, so I will keep you all posted on how it goes, because I'm experimenting. Another instance that we run into while working with clients is that they are unresponsive when we need them, but yet when they need us, we are expected to respond immediately. Unfortunately, this has become commonplace in a work culture where everyone is expected to be online and available at all times. And maybe that's cool with you. But for me, that doesn't really work with my lifestyle or my working style. I need focused blocks of deep work to produce my best results. And that's why I can't be plugged in online to every email and phone call. That's why as I build a relationship with a client, I work with them to set clear expectations for communication. A big one there is setting specific dates by which I will have a first draft to them or a second draft so everyone knows when we're gonna hear from each other and check in. Now, of course, we do have to work within the client's frameworks, but we also can come to the table with asks based on what we know will produce the best work. And if the client is unreasonable, I fire them. 
I mean, they can fire us, we can fire them too. When I make it clear and then deliver on the promise that my best work goes to those clients that are clear, respectful, and patient, I feel like more of those clients come my way. All right, the seventh, I think we're on our seventh scenario, and this one is around deliverables. And it's the common scenario where a client wants us to turn over all of our raw footage and photos at the end of a shoot without having a track record that they can actually edit that. And that can put us in a tricky situation for two reasons. The first is we don't want to look bad when we envision the client scanning through all of our raw footage, seeing a ton of unusable moments. I know I start thinking, do they have any idea what raw footage actually looks like. And secondly, do I want my name attached to this final product, which I have no confidence in? Well, sometimes we have no choice but to hand it all over. And actually that can be really nice. Film, pass it off, send the invoice, boom. But if I want to take the edit, I think there are more opportunities than I previously realized to upsell the edit. I try to make my client realize that I can save them so much time and money by taking on the edit. I tell them that I know where the footage is, I know the footage. I paint the scenario of them spending hours going through everything just to find these small moments that I can find instantly because I was the one who shot it. Once a client realizes how much time an edit takes, they often will pay me to just take it off their hands. Now to wrap up our final few scenarios, I posed this question to some of my freelance friends and communities asking, what they have encountered when it comes to common yet frustrating client scenarios. And I got some great answers. A lot of people loved this one from Stephanie Goeda in which she said, quote, the client really wants to see what you've got experience filming with blue couches, but your portfolio only shows red couches. Do you have anything else that they can look at to help push you through? Yeah, I don't, I think that's pretty, that one's pretty self-explanatory. And that might not be the best client to keep around. <laughs> All right, so one of my good friends, Ryan Wilkes, who is a cinematographer based in Canada, also had a great one to add to this list. And I thought it'd be a nice one to end this week's video on. He said that one thing that's very common for us freelance filmmakers to face is a race to the bottom landscape. This is a landscape where other freelancers are so desperate for work that they will quote very low prices to get clients. And that leaves us with fewer work opportunities where people are actually willing to pay what we're worth. So then we feel like we need to lower our prices and the cycle continues. If I encounter this situation, I try to fight this urge to race to the bottom because in the long run, I don't believe it is the way to build a sustainable or fulfilling business. If I'm the fastest, cheapest person, I'm just a cog in a machine. I'm just cranking it out and no one cares about me because the minute someone's faster and cheaper than me, they'll switch. What I want is to find work where it is unmistakably me and where clients value the work that is unmistakably me. I love this passage from Seth Godin who says, if you're a freelancer, the only question is how do I get better clients? That's it. Because you can't work more hours. The only difference between great freelancers and good freelancers is that great freelancers have better clients. Better clients demand better work. Better clients pay on time. They pay more. They talk about your work. Better clients are not simply richer versions of bad clients. It's a totally different attitude. And better clients tend to want to work with freelancers who are the kind of freelancers who deserve better clients. So you have to start by acting that way first. You start by acting, not to say, what do you need done? I'll do it because if your motto is you can pick anyone and I'm anyone, then it's a race to the bottom. The alternative is to say, no, I do this and I do this specifically. And I'm sorry if you want that. Here's a phone number of someone who does that, but I do this. And that's very scary, which is why very few people do it. But hopefully if you're here watching this video, you are here to walk that scary path with courage. Just know that you are not alone as you do so. And with that, Let's wrap up the video. Please, if you enjoyed this, can you subscribe to the channel, share it with a friend who might also get value from it. I'd love to continue reaching more people and your vote of confidence to the other filmmakers in your network goes an incredibly long way. So thank you. And with that, I'll see you next week. Go out and tell some stories.